At the beginning of the Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas Aquinas, after having devoted one question to theological methodology, then passes on to the first question which governs an Aristotelian science. In order to consider a subject matter, you need to prove first that it exists. And so Prima Par's question two is devoted to this question. And the third article is the one that contains the famous five ways or five proofs for the existence of God. St. Thomas is famous in each of the articles of the Summa Theologiae for first uh, entertaining objections to what he will in turn prove. And one of the objections to the existence of God comes through with great urgency and it comes through with great kind of existential import. He says simply that there is evil in the world and if it is the case that the God whom you claim to exist is good, such a state of affairs simply cannot be reconciled with the belief and so we must deny the existence of God. Now, as we consider uh, reconciling a world in which evil exists and a God whom Christians claim is good, we need to be clear about how we approach the question, our methodology. <clears throat> and I think there are two main options that lie before us, one which we can call the contemplative and one which we can call the more accusatory. Here's a word from a Dominican who uh, was a son of the English province who lived in the last century. He writes, when confronted by suffering, we are liable to two apparently contrasting reactions. We may reject God as infantile, as unable to comprehend or have compassion on those who suffer and are made to suffer in this world. On the other hand, we may find, as Job did, that it was our own view that was infantile. We may, in fact, come to a deeper understanding of the mystery of God. So as we approach the consideration, uh, we make no judgment as to who or what is infantile but we try to adopt a contemplative stance. So one that is not accusatory, but one that is broken open to the mysteries at stake with the desire to plumb the depths thereof. So let's set up the argument and then we're going to do the work of making distinctions and then at the end offer a kind of solution which you will find to be dissatisfactory as a solution, but perhaps satisfactory as a, as a deeper entry into the mystery. So what we're doing right here is often described as theodicy, from the words theos and dk, which mean respectively God and justice. So theodicy is introduced as a genre by Leibniz, who lived uh, in the 17th and 18th century, although it has antecedents in the philosophical tradition. And it's something that arises in light of the historical circumstances of that time. So a time riven by wars of religion, a time riven by great disease and pestilence, a time associated with peculiar and uh, very grave suffering. So in light of these things, uh, many were led to ask the question whether God could, ex could exist or whether God or belief in God were tenable in light of these things. And so as C.S. Lewis later came to describe it, we put God in the dock and we made him to answer for all of our woes and we're not satisfied until such time as he could be acquitted of the charges. So this comes through in the 20th century and in contemporary literature uh, in terms of what is sometimes called the atheistic syllogism. This is a distillation of what many have thought and speculated upon for centuries. So we'll put it in this way. First premise is that God is all good. This premise is taken from Christian revelation. The second premise is that God is all powerful. This premise too is taken from Christian revelation. The implication of premise one, as the syllogizer continues, is that an all-good being works for the elimination of evil to the extent that he is capable. All right, so that is the purported implication of the first premise. Next, implication of premise two. An all-powerful being is maximally capable of affecting his plans. Okay, so this is seen as just teasing out the logic of an all-powerful God. And yet, the fifth proposition observes evil exists. And so, the conclusion, therefore, God does not. So in order to unwind some of the difficulties, or in order to shed light on some of the obscurities that are attendant upon this type of reasoning, let's just take a few points in turn. So we're going to discuss first the nature of evil, and then we'll discuss further how God's agency is understood in light of evil. And then the last large point will be a consideration of the nature of God. And then we'll kind of wrap up with some concluding thoughts. So first, the nature of evil. Here, 
I take for a leading light the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, whose feast we celebrate today. And as concerns evil, St. Thomas stands stably or firmly within the Augustinian tradition. So St. Augustine explains or opines or proves that evil is but a privation of the good, privatio boni. So evil, on this understanding, is not a something. Okay, evil is not a something. And this would be over and against some dualistic notions or dualistic understandings of the material world, ones with which St. Augustine himself was, you know, intimately associated at a time in his life, and one that St. Thomas would have been well aware of, given the setting of his own life and the rise of Catharism or Albigensianism, which was also a dualistic um, heresy at the time that he lived. So evil, we're contending here, is not something, contra-dualism, but rather the lack of something, the peculiar lack of something. So by evil is signified a certain absence or privation of the good which is due. By privation, we don't simply mean absence or negation. We mean the absence of something which ought to be there, or a peculiar absence, a remarkable absence. So evil inheres in the good by a kind of parasitic existence. So it's something that we remark concerning a good thing that what ought to be there is not, and that causes us uh, concern, or that causes us, at the very least, to comment upon the fact that it is such. So let's distinguish further among types of evil. The language on different types of evil is various within the tradition. Here I'm using uh, language that is generally well agreed upon. So it's not too contentious, but you may have heard it in other terms. So we can divide between physical evil and moral evil. So physical evil is sometimes described as evil suffered. Uh, the Latin word attributed is pena, P-O-E-N-A, which is often translated as penalty or punishment. Okay, So this is an evil which is in the thing itself an evil which is in the thing itself. So an example that comes up often in Aristotle and Aquinas is blindness, blindness. So for a creature that sees, whether it be a duck or a human being, it is an evil, a privation of the good that they cannot see because such is their bodily nature that they call for sight. And when it's not there, we remark upon the fact that it is not and we proclaim that to be evil. By contrast, we would not say that a rock is blind or that um, a hydrangea is blind because the nature of mineral or the nature of plant is not such that it calls for sight. And so again, this helps us to clarify what we mean by a peculiar absence or the lack of something due. So in the case of a physical evil, here, let's consider how physical evil might be introduced with different agents interacting. So some good is willed and the achievement of that good destroys something else. And the contention is further that God is indirectly implicated in this fact. A classic example is carnivores or omnivorous creatures. You can think of a lion. A lion subsists on the destruction of antelope. Lions cannot get by on a vegetarian or vegan diet. Okay, so in order for a lion to flourish, it is required that other animals perish. Now, I mean, while this may seem kind of funny at first blush, many people take this very seriously. They see it baked into reality that some things must die in order that some things must flourish. Nature red in tooth and claw. So this is seen as a kind of evil, a physical evil, inasmuch as reality is set up in such a way that some things need die in order that some things grow. Uh, a kind of initial response to this, and we're not trying to explain it away, but an initial response to this is just to observe that this is something that is immediately attendant upon what we understand by the law of conservation of matter. So Herbert McCabe, from whom I quoted earlier, writes that, in general, it seems to me that you cannot make material things that develop in time without allowing for the fact that in perfecting themselves, they will damage other material things. So that's just a simple claim, that's phenomenologically, he's not arguing for that, it's just an observation. In order for lions to flourish, it need be the case that antelope perish. But you say, why could not lions be uh, vegetarians or vegans? Well, then they would cease to be lions, right? Because their characteristics would change in such remarkable fashion, uh, physiologically, that they would be a different thing. Okay, well, 
why are we content with vegetarians or vegans? But is it not the case that their flourishing entails the destruction of plants? And as for the flourishing of plants, does not their flourishing entail the destruction of certain nutrients, right? They're just gobbling up sunlight. They're so very greedy in that regard, okay? So that's just an initial introduction to physical evil. Let's pass now to moral evil, which is far more complex and far more troubling. Moral evil we will sometimes hear referred to as evil done. The word used in Latin that crops up in the Christian tradition is culpa, which means often guilt or fault. Here we're attributing that to intellectual creatures which are capable of such things. What then is this type of evil, moral evil or evil done? Here, what we're talking about is the privation of due order in a free act, which includes the omission of an act which is morally obligatory. Okay, I'll repeat that. The privation of due order in a free act, which includes the omission of an act which is morally obligatory. How it's often described is that one chooses an apparent good to the neglect of a true good, which introduces disorder into the agent and into those affected by the choice. So let's say that you're just toddling along down the quad, okay, and you pass over the bike lane, but immediately in front of you, someone else had passed over the bike lane, but they hadn't been paying attention because they were texting, and a biker, who was presuming the right of way, right, on account of the fact that this is a bike lane, uh, they just bowled over that individual. The person was tossed from the bike, he planted his arms, breaking both of them. The other person was thrown into a bush. Uh, maybe it was a succulent of some sort, maybe even a cactus. <laughs> Let's just say that, that both of them fared not too terribly well, okay? So in that instance, the person who was texting was choosing an apparent good, namely the constant communication with their beloved friend from whom they cannot be separated, the thought of which would be odious, okay? But in so choosing, they endangered the, the general welfare of the polity, which is this university. And then there was, a, there was an evil perpetrated, okay? So they hurt another human being. So it's not so much that you're choosing evil, it's not so much that you're deciding that the world burn for the mere delight that the world burn, but rather you're choosing an apparent good or what appears to you as good, and in so choosing you neglect what ought be affirmed or what ought be prized. Sin, as this evil is often described, is a matter of culpably missing the mark. The word uh, that occurs in the New Testament for sin, hamartia, means just that, to miss the mark. It's often taken from descriptions of archery. You know, you, you shoot for something, but instead you hit something else. So you shoot for a kind of affirmation of integrity or an integral affirmation of goods as they are arranged hierarchically, right? So you want to know the truth about God and you want to live well in society. You want to, you know, work towards the raising up of a healthy next generation. You want to continue living. But sometimes you affirm those goods in improper order. You might be fearful for the preservation of your own life and so you deny the true faith. Or you might be so driven mad by base desire that you undermine the good of a friendship, okay? So this is what we're talking about, missing the mark. And with this type of evil, it's more scandalous because we recognize immediately that it could have been otherwise. It could have been otherwise, which is why when persons perpetrate this type of evil, they are often riven by regret because they recognize the fact that they could have done something else and they ought to have done something else and would that they had done something else. So this type of evil is not an inevitable feature of the world, and it introduces no goodness. So by contrast to physical evil, where we saw that the flourishing of the lion entails the destruction or perishing of the antelope, here there is no good introduced. There is no good introduced. Rather, it diminishes the humanity of the perpetrator. It's not like he's building himself up at the expense of others. He's actually destroying himself and destroying others in turn. So then let's describe briefly, as a way of uh, summation for this first point, the causality of evil. How is it that we can even speak intelligently about agency exercised when it concerns evil? Well, St. Thomas uses the classic distinction of the four causes, which he inherits from Aristotle. So you have the material cause, which is the stuff from which. You have the formal cause, which is what makes the thing to be what it is. You have the efficient cause, which what brings, is what brings it about. And then you have the final cause, which is that for the sake of which. So again, material cause, the stuff out of which, the formal cause, what makes it to be what it is, the efficient cause, which brings it into its present state, and then the final cause, that for the sake of which it is made. So a helpful illustration, Aristotle will use the example of a bronze statue. So we'll say the stuff from which the material cause is the bronze, 
The formal cause is the shape of the statue, which organizes the matter to be a bronze statue. The efficient cause is the artisan or the sculptor. And then the final cause is perhaps the beautification of the place that it adorns, okay? Or um, the honoring of the person who is made into said sculpture. Now let's talk, of this, talk about uh, the four causes as concerns evil. So the material cause of evil is the good, okay? So a good action. So you're doing an action, right? You're affirming a thing. You're, in the case of the person who's texting, who is borne down upon on the bike path, um, they are affirming the good of their friendship, of their relationship. So it's, it's, it's parasitic upon a good act. But there is no formal cause. There is no formal cause to speak of because rather it's a privation, we said. It's the absence of what ought to inform that act or the absence of the hierarchy that ought to obtain. What is more, there is no final cause of an evil action. An evil action is always touched by a bit of madness. Uh, there's a Dominican friar of my province who tells a story that he heard tell of. So this is like, this is already three people removed. So the chances of it being true are exceedingly small, but it's still charming, so I will repeat it. Um, so this was a moral theology professor in our studium who was describing his first moral thought. And he remembers being, uh, you know, like a small child with his younger sister, and they were playing maybe with blocks or something like that. And at a certain point, she had a thing, and he wanted the thing, and so he took the thing from her and then pushed her down. And then immediately afterwards, his mother swooped onto the scene, saw the aftermath as his you know, sister was crying, and asked him, why did you do that? And this individual remembers having had the thought, why are you asking me for a good reason for an obviously bad act? Pretty sage for like a four-year-old, all right? <laughs> but in every sin, we recognize in hindsight that it was madness. It was madness. And we feel that, too, in a kind of existential way. Like sometimes, let's say that you've agreed to fast for some intention. You want to fast for your friend who is sick, and you want to apply the merits of that fasting. But at about 1045, right, it begins. You're like, I really want to have lunch now. And it's not like, you know, I'm a little bit hungry, and um, I exercised this morning, so perhaps my caloric intake from breakfast was insufficient. It's not like kind of simple, sane thoughts like that. At about 10.45, you start thinking, I'm going to die. <laughs> right? so, so evil has a, has a way of introducing madness into the mind. And as we you know, come to appreciate it in hindsight, we're like, I have no idea what happened there. All right. So finally, so we've talked about the matter is the good act. The form is a privation, so it's, there is no formal cause. Uh, the final cause is, is a kind of madness. There is no true final cause to speak of. And St. Thomas adds, there's no real efficient cause either. There's no real efficient cause. He says, it's only efficient cause in a matter of speaking. Rather, we should speak of it as a deficient cause. The evil is introduced in a kind of accidental way. He says this can happen by a defect of the principal agent, a defect of the instrument, or indisposition of the matter. Those aren't especially helpful descriptors at this stage, but now... Uh, a more helpful illustration. Take this example. Let's say that you are attempting to correct your friend on some behavior which you think is destructive. Um, let's say that your friend is caught up in a recent fad. Let's say that yo-yos have come back, okay? <laughs> it's been about 23 years, I think it's time, okay? But your friend is yo-yoing with such reckless abandon that he is actually neglecting the duties of his state. So he's a sixth year graduate student. He's pursuing a PhD in optics, but he has not performed any of his experiments recently because he has been yo-yoing. And he comes into social situations and he boasts about all of the new tricks that he's learned. You know, he explains to you that he has walked the dog continuously for 37 seconds, you know, on an unwaxed Duncan ball bearing. And you're like, that's great, okay, right? But you're beginning to be concerned about him. And, and what is more, you're beginning to pity him, okay? And so, you gin up the courage to correct him about this. But it goes off poorly. So you, you try to present before him your concerns, you try to explain it in a generous way, and you, you try to carry the point in a way that will affect his moral conversion away from yo-yo dumb and back to optics. Right? But he blows up, and then it, kind of as a way of sticking it to you, he, he leaves, you know, he like gets a flight out uh, to San Jose to attend a two-week yo-yo convention, you know, just to rub it in your eye. So here, let's talk about the defect of the principal agent, the defect of the instrument, and the indisposition of the matter. Defect of the principal agent, pride. 
Okay, it's perhaps the case that you corrected him in a prideful or haughty way. This is a generation that is especially sensitive to condescension, uh, and we can smell the least hint of it when it is on the breath of our accuser. And so you think that yo-yoing is infantile. You think that it's childish that he is caught up in such a pursuit, and you can't help but pity and almost deride him, and he can sense that. He can sense that. And you lead with that, and that really turns him off. So defect of the principal agent. Defect of the instrument. Let's say, too, that you delivered this blow over the phone. Okay? You wanted to do it in person, but he didn't come to your usual Starbucks date. And then you just had a sense of urgency that it needed to be done. You needed to acquit yourself of this responsibility, and so you did it over the phone. Or maybe even you texted him. But regardless of which medium you chose, whether it be on the phone or you know, through text message or some other impersonal medium, you weren't able to carry a warmth or a depth of concern. You weren't able to like, communicate that adequately because the instrument could not bear the communication. So defect of the instrument. Third, indisposition of the matter. It's perhaps the case that he was just ill-suited at the time to receive your correction. Okay, maybe he's yo-yoing as a coping mechanism. Maybe there's something like very disastrous going on in his life. Or maybe there's something just like very sad at home. Or maybe he's just experiencing achadia or sloth, right? He's been at this program a long time, and he's actually sad because he set himself such a lofty goal, and he fears that he can't actually achieve the goal. And now he wishes that he had never started this PhD program because it's like an albatross around his neck. So what he actually needs addressed in his life is his deep and thoroughgoing melancholy. But what you've chosen to address is the yo-yoing. So in this position of the matter, okay? So here, tangentially, when it concerns fraternal correction, we're often told that, that three considerations need be uh, esteemed. So first, one asks, do I love him? Second, I ask, does this matter? And third, I ask, can he change? Can he change? Is there a legitimate hope? As a way by which to address these concerns of the defect of the agent, do I love him, the defect of the instrument, can he change, or does this matter, and then the indisposition of the matter, can he change? So that's just the first point to describe the nature of evil. So we talked about it as a privation. We distinguish between physical and moral evil, and then we just did a little breakdown of the causality of evil to shed a kind of light on this obscure thing, this mysterium iniquitatis. So second, the sense of evil and God's agency. I'll read you a passage, and then we'll describe it a bit. This is from uh, Prima Pars, question 48, article 2, response to the third objection. St. Thomas describes evil in two questions in the Prima Pars, question 48 and 49. So we said one question on methodology, and then 42 questions on God, one in triune, and then there's a treatise there about creation, 44 through 49, the last two of which concern evil. He writes, God and nature and any other agent make what is best in the whole, but not what is best in every single part, except in order to the whole. And the whole itself, which is the universe of creatures, is all the better and more perfect if some things in it can fail in goodness, and do sometimes fail, God not preventing this. This happens firstly because it belongs to providence not to destroy but to save nature, as Dionysius says. But it belongs to nature that what may fail should sometimes fail. Secondly, because, as Augustine says, God is so powerful that he can even make good out of evil. Hence, many good things would be taken away if God permitted no evil to exist. For fire would not be generated if air was not corrupted, nor would the life of a lion be preserved unless the ass were killed. Neither would avenging justice nor the patience of a sufferer be praised if there were no injustice. So what we're going to do here is kind of exposit this text and talk about why God would permit physical evil and God, why, why God would permit moral evil uh, as a way of introducing our final point concerning the nature of God. So a couple of general points to begin with. Privation, we said, is not a thing. It is a no thing, or it is the peculiar absence of a thing. So already here we have a foothold for establishing God's innocence. That's a very modest design. That's a very uh, kind of modest goal, but I think it's a, it's a place to begin. So there is nothing created that we are describing when we are describing evil. We're describing a kind of uncreation. And therefore, what we are not describing is uh, the fruit or the result of a direct action of God or even of the agent. So God is not to be held responsible for something that is not, at least in a basic sense. 
Now that might be helpful, but it also might provoke in you a kind of desire to push back, and that's good, because that's what we're going to address as we advance. Evil, in this understanding, has but a logical being, right? So it doesn't have strict metaphysical status. It's not a thick type of thing. So theodicy, strictly speaking, is a kind of category error, inasmuch as you are accusing God for something that is not. You are accusing God for something that is not. So, why permit physical evil? Why permit physical evil? Um, there's a Aquinas 101 video that came out recently about the problem of evil, and in it, Father Dominic uses a text or uses an example taken from an article written by uh, Professor Ed Fazer, who's at Pasadena City College. And he says, take for example an incomplete circle. Say you, you draw a circle and you only complete 270 degrees of it. Why would you do such a thing? It's evil that the circle not be completed. But he says, maybe you're using the circle as a way by which to explain privation. Maybe you're using it as an example to elucidate a philosophical point. And then there would be a purpose in your making of something imperfect. So when we talk about physical evil, we're not just going to look at the fact that there is 90 degrees missing, but we're trying to address what the 270 degrees might be instrumental in making manifest. So granting what we said about the law of conservation of matter, right? we said that some things in their upbuilding entail the destruction of others, why could we not make a further argument that there ought not to be things in existence which are such, which build themselves up by the perishing of their prey? This is sometimes referred to as the Buddhist objection. Because if you take it to be the case that the purpose of creation is the minimization of suffering, then it seems that God has done a very strange thing in creating as he has. With this, we reorient our considerations and then look to how God has revealed himself in creation, specifically his purpose in creation. Recall that God does not need creation. God was not um, laid up in his heavens looking for a time at which his you know, lingering need for companionship would be adequately addressed and then he chose to create. No. God creates out of an abundance of love to afford creation a share in his divine life. So it's done by a kind of excess, by a kind of overflow. So God is about a work not of addressing a need, nor is he about a work of minimizing suffering. Rather, he's about a work of manifestation. He's about a work of making known his manifest perfections so that in the contemplation of those perfections, made known through a variety of creatures, all of creation could return to him unto the praise of his glory. So in this spirit, we ask, would it be better not to have lions? Would it be better not to have lions? There's a reason that when we go to Disney World, if people here go to Disney World, I suppose people here more often go to Disneyland. But on a senior class trip, I once went to Disney World. And I'd never been, but I'd heard it described as a kind of mythical place in which all one's dreams come true. So I went with a kind of eager expectation. And then I found that Space Mountain was just a wild mouse in the dark. <laughs> and being a tall person, I was naturally terrified that I was going to graze a low-hanging bar. And so I found Magic Kingdom very discomforting. Um, but I found Animal Kingdom electric. It was great, incredible. Why? Because they put us in a kind of like buggy and then drove us around to see wild beasts. I was like, yes, sign me up. Um, why did we pay so much for a zoo? <laughs> These things are free in many cities. Um, but we, we marvel at lions, right? We're upset when the lions are sleeping in their little you know, kind of shelter. We like rattle the cage so that we can see them stand up and roar, that we can have the sheer delight of being terrified, okay? So is it better that we not have lions? Consult your experience of having watched Planet Earth documentaries. Okay, the first one came out, I was in college. So it came out maybe like 15 years ago. And I remember the Shallow Seas episode when there were like a, a bunch of seals that were making their way out to the ocean off the Cape of Good Hope. And then you saw those seals, one by one, picked off by huge great white sharks. It was incredible. The sharks would like shoot themselves out of the water with, I mean, it was, I, words fail, okay? Big sharks out of the water by a big distance, exceeding even that of a humpback whale. And then they would, you know, crush a seal and then pump their tail and then go back in the water. And I wasn't taking like a strange delight in seeing seals die, right? <laughs> but I was taking a great delight in seeing great white sharks be great white sharks. So would it be better that there not be lions? Would it be better that there not be great white sharks? That's just, I leave that to you. I'm not going to address that. 
We can ask further with regard to physical evil. In what sense is pain good? In what sense is pain good? Here again, I'm not going to attempt a thoroughgoing proof. But if we did not feel pain, think about how our lives would be far more difficult. Right? There are some people who have this illness where they can't actually detect uh, sensations at the end of their nerves. Right? And so for them, it's very, very dangerous because they're constantly bumping into things, getting cuts, having them infected, or touching hot things that they oughtn't. I once had frostbite on my feet, and I would you know, go to a hot beach, and then I would look around and people would be like, this is a hot beach. And I'd be like, I will take your word for it, you know? <laughs> Which for me was scary because I could burn the bottom of my feet not realizing that I was on a hot beach. So in what sense is pain good? Let's move on from that point. So our last description then of this evil suffered, or what we've called physical evil, is that we can appreciate how the penalty, when we're talking about rational creatures, accords with God's justice. How it accords with God's justice. God's justice demands, okay, we're not going to insist upon that too strictly, but God's justice demands that suitable punishments be meted out to sinners, whether for personal sin or for original sin, and that there is a goodness in this divine purpose. Not because God's wrath need be sated, not because God is an exacting accountant, right, and he needs all of these sins atoned for in number and in kind and will not be content until such time as you suffer the least or you suffer the last drop of punishment, but because it's good for us. It's good for us to be participants and sharers in the restoration of justice because by enacting it in our bodies, by actually rehearsing it in our members, it inheres more deeply within us. Tangentially, this is the, pur like, this is the purpose of worship. It simply is the case that God is our creator and end. As to whether or not we recognize that, it's immaterial. But it's exceedingly important for us as individuals because by worshiping, we can actually make present, living and effective what obtains in the objective order and then be reconciled to it so as thereby not to live in rebellion against the facts, but rather to enter into them willingly and therefore experience a kind of joy, peace, and contentment. So that's just, those are just kind of heuristics, adumbrations of arguments. That's not, that's not an attempt at a proof, but we can bring those back up in the question and answer session. Let's then talk about moral evil. This is more mysterious yet. So St. Thomas Aquinas is a, is a close reader of Pseudo Dionysius, 5th, 6th century Syriac monk. He actually quotes from him more than many other authors who, would you, who you'd think he'd quote from with great frequency. So St. Thomas quotes from the scriptures most, then he quotes from Augustine and Aristotle, about the same amount, and then after that he quotes from Pseudo Dionysius and St. Gregory the Great, next most. So they're, they're farther down the line, but he esteems their testimony uh, very much. Pseudo Dionysius has an understanding of creation it's called uh, the Cosmic Continuity Principle. The short version is this. God fills creation as much as it can be filled. Now, that's not a strict claim because God could have done creation in a way different. But basically, what he means by this is that God fills every facet of reality with creatures. So he makes minerals, he makes plants, he makes animals, he makes men, he makes angels. And each rank kind of touches the next higher rank at its lowest point. So we touch what it means to be an angel when we have intuitive bursts of insight. Our intellects, you know, kind of plod through steps ordinarily, but sometimes we have a taste of what it means to think like an angel. So the, the purpose of explaining this principle is simply to say that God has filled creation with all of this abundant testimony of his interior life. He has expended himself in saying many created things, all of which were down to the praise of his glory. And the perfection of the universe, we can say, kind of requires that there should be inequality in things so that every grade of goodness may be realized. So God is not about a work of bland egalitarianism. He's not saying, like, everyone here is a winner. Everyone here gets a trophy. Everyone gets a, a star and a ribbon and a humpback whale. No. <laughs> he wants it so that he is made known in a variety of ways, right? And each rank of creation, and each human person, we might add in the same breath, is uniquely suited to tell something glorious about God. So, a goodness which can fail is different, and therefore tells us something unique about the goodness of God. So rocks proceed to their end inexorably. They cannot but be rocky. Plants proceed to their end inexorably. They cannot but be planty. Animals proceed to their end instinctually. 
they cannot but finish or realize the term of their existence. But we, among all of material creation, are uniquely suited to know our end and to choose it as an act of the will. It can actually issue from us interiorly. So we have a kind of cognitive and volitional engagement with our end. We can turn from it or we can embrace it. And that's dramatic, but it's also distinct. It's also distinct. So we are made to know the end and to pursue it, but defectively, right? That's not God's intent that we do it defectively, but he admits for the possibility that we could defect from our end. So in this, we make manifest the glory of God in a way that would otherwise be invisible. Clarification. This is not a free will defense. I'm not saying that God permits us to sin, otherwise free will would be endangered. Okay, because God is more interior to man than man is himself. And God can move the will sweetly and strongly because he is the creator of the will. And he can do it in such a fashion that that action is free. So God could have done that, but he chose otherwise. He chose this. He chose that we make manifest his glory, sometimes by adhering or clinging or cleaving to his will, and sometimes by defecting from it. So then the question arises, is God guilty of neglects? Ought God have done otherwise? Ought he have done better? So do we have a claim against God, a kind of claim of justice? Here, I think it's helpful to understand that in creation, God doesn't just furnish us with a nature, but he furnishes us with a nature that is both the principle of identity and of unfolding. What do I mean by that? To use like Aristotelian jargon, God doesn't only make the act, he also makes the potency. So God doesn't only make the thing to be what it is, but he also makes it such that the possibilities for its unfolding are set for it. That is to say that when I am created, I can only be a few different kinds of things, right? So I could be like an NBA basketball player. I could be a librarian. I could be an optician. I could be a Catholic priest. But I can't be a robot, right? I can't be something other than what I am. Nor can I be 150 feet tall, right? Nor can I run on methane gas. Because baked into what I am are the very terms of my flourishing. Baked into what I am is the very possibility of my unfolding in this, that, or the other way. So I have to eat things that are nutritious for me and don't cause me to explode, okay? I can only aspire to be six feet, four inches, and no further. Right? Because I'm not interested in what types of hormones I'd have to take to exceed my range. All right? So, I, the terms of my flourishing are set by the fact of my being created as such. So God makes the thing to be, and also he sets the terms for how it is to unfold. And as concerns creation, God is not guilty of neglects, inasmuch as he makes the thing, and he makes its unfolding to be possible in the way that it is. Is this the best of all possible worlds that God could have made? No. St. Thomas is very clear on this point. It's in the Prima Pars, at the end of the treatise on the one God. And you just quote scripture, and it says, no, scripture says he could have made a better one. Simply, simply so called. He says there are three ways or three things in which God cannot exceed his creative power. One, he says, is the, um, the incarnation. So the Lord Jesus Christ. The next, he says, is created beatitude. God could not have made a participation in his divine life better than what he affords us. And the third, he says, is the blessed mother. Pretty cool. So God is not guilty of neglects inasmuch as it's not as if he fails to give us what we need because he actually makes the terms of what we need. So the the third and final point for this is just to say that there is a theological strain which tries to identify how it can be somehow better that evil is permitted. The words you often hear said are, O happy fault, which merited for us such a savior, which are repeated at the exultet, uh, which are taken from um, the utterance of St. Augustine himself. So God permits evil to draw forth from it some good. Oftentimes it said some greater good. God permits evil to draw forth from it some greater good. And here we saw in that passage that St. Thomas describes how the patience of the martyrs is only possible in light of the torments of their persecutors. Now that is a terrible thing, and especially when we think about it in terms of the atrocities of the 20th century, when we think about it when it's written on the grandest of grand scales, and certainly this is like the Stephen Fry argument, that he cannot abide the company of a God who would permit these atrocious things to occur. So I don't think we should ramp it all the way up to that 
um, degree at, at the outset, but try to appreciate the wisdom of it in more modest circumstances and consult our own experience, right? And I think that this is actually a helpful spiritual discipline. So when something bad happens to you, to think, what is God's purpose in this? Very rarely do you get a clear, coherent, and propositional answer. Like, ah, yes, I've had three surgeries uh, on this particular thing, and now the status quo is worse than it once was. I ought never to have touched it. Alas and alack, would that I could turn back the clock. What are you teaching me in this, Lord? Very rarely do you get a clear, it's for this reason. You know, it's to humble you. It's to correct your vanity. It's because you would love me more at the end of it. But in asking, in asking the question, what do we get? We get God. Okay, that's tangential. All right, last point. And this is very short, so take heart. The nature of God. Let's clarify the divine attributes at play. We began with the atheistic syllogism, which focuses especially on God's goodness and on God's power. So goodness is not to be confused with optimization of benevolence or beneficence. Goodness is not to be confused with the optimization of benevolence or beneficence. So you can consult your own prudential judgments. You could be doing a lot better things right now in the objective order. Right? You could be feeding the hungry. The fact that you are sitting here passively listening to someone lecture about the nature of evil is contemptible. We didn't make a judgment that our lives are to be expended in doing the maximal good at all times as understood by some objective criterion of what the maximal good consists in. Because your doing of good is peculiar to you in a way that, that bespeaks vocation. Right? If one were called to do the maximal good at all times, well, the, the church's tradition speaks of religious life as a state of perfection. Therefore, all persons should become religious, and then the human race would be extinct, provided they are good religious, in one generation. Okay. Right? So what we're talking about is not just an objective thing to which all must adhere because vocation is personal. So too, when we talk about God's goodness, we're not talking about the optimization of benevolence. Right? God could have made us with wings. He didn't. Do we begrudge that? Perhaps a bit. Okay? So, next. Omnipotence versus maximal exercise of power. St. Thomas has a beautiful point here that God makes us to be causes. Why? Because he loves. Because he loves. God could do everything that is done directly and without the administration or ministration of instruments or secondary causes. There is nothing that is done that falls outside the bounds of his causal power. But God chooses to use agents or lie agents in his saving designs. You can think about this in terms of the sacramental order. God could remit original sin in any way he saw fit, but he chooses to do it by washing with water. He chooses to huddle you around a font with 20 of your closest family members, one of whom is inevitably deaf and tells the priest to speak louder, okay? From experience, <laughs> right? And he chooses to remit sin by washing with water. Why? Because he humbles himself to use water, to use a fallible human minister, right? To use godparents, to entrust godparents with raising a person in the faith provided that, or, you know, should they, should they be called upon to do such. So God uses us as instruments, not because he needs us, because it is good that we be allied to him as such. Because in that, we are not only made to be recipients of grace, passive recipients of grace, but actual agents in the distributing of grace. And so we are made more like him, which is the purpose of life, not merely to not sin or to skate by or to be nice, but rather to be like God. And so God, in somehow staying his hand, actually proves himself generous beyond comparison. Whereas if he were to kind of crassly exercise him, uh, his omnipotence, he would be like micromanagerial in a way that would be oppressive beyond compare. Now, mind you, to use these images um, is not you know, entirely helpful, and the analogy is limp, but we can begin to appreciate it. Finally, uh, a thought about the providence of God versus the absent God. God is not just one cause among a welter of particular causes. Rather, God is a universal cause. So he doesn't attend, as St. Thomas talks about in this passage, to correcting the defect of each particular cause. Rather, he's more so concerned with the ecosystematic harmony of the whole that takes in mind or takes to heart each individual as pertaining to that whole. This is like a language that we've learned or lost the capacity to speak, language of, of common goods that are truly transcendent, not competitive, not scarce, but truly transcendent. So God is not 
trying to address the defects of each particular cause in say and to stay the hand of each sinner so that when a particular cause departs from him uh, in transgression he doesn't just rein it back in in a kind of crass way but it returns to him in penitence it's said in one of the Father Brown stories and quoted in Brideshead Revisited that God is such that he permits one to wander to the very edge of the earth only to pull him back by the twitch upon a thread so God is competent of all of these causes as more interior to them than they are to themselves as giving them their being but also as the cause of their agency and also is omnicompetent in his providence to see to it that all that occurs within the bounds of the field redounds to the praise of his glory and that's good so the beginning of an explanation uh, this is a final word from Salvifici Dolores, which is written by Pope St. John Paul II. Christ does not answer directly, and he does not answer in the abstract, this human questioning about the meaning of suffering. Man hears Christ's saving answer as he himself gradually becomes a sharer in the sufferings of Christ. So a lot of what we have done to this point is kind of ground clearing, but, like I said, in a dissatisfying way, because it, it does not afford us a real entry into the mystery uh, of what is good on offer or a real access to the intelligibility which might be for the having. Here I think that this type of questioning can only really be had in satisfactory way at the foot of the cross and that's the point of what St. John Paul II describes in this passage. That we can do the philosophical work to deflect bad criticisms, right, to clarify muddled thinking and to exculpate God from these charges, but ultimately our human questioning about the meaning of suffering cannot be answered once and for all or in the abstract. It only is answered to the extent that one becomes a sharer in the sufferings of Christ. And the ultimate horizon of indication and the ultimate horizon of intelligibility is heaven. So here again, a commendation of the contemplative stance. McCabe writes, somehow the infinite goodness of God is compatible with his allowing sin. We do not know how, but it is good to recognize this, for it reminds us that we know nothing of God and his purposes, except that he loves us and wishes us to share his life of love. Thank you.